Welcome to the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum and our Western Heritage Awards. You know, this is a great night. For 52 years, we've inducted worthy individuals into our halls of fame. We've honored Western writers and actors and filmmakers and musicians, all of whom make lasting contributions to the legacy of the American West. That's a tradition that we hold with pride. Everett? Thank you, Chuck. It is indeed a great honor to see so many uh, active Western performers and, uh, and uh, constituents of this museum here tonight. Tonight's honorees receive a beautiful bronze Wrangler Award, sculpted by talented Preto West artist Harold Holden. Harold, can you please stand and let us applaud your great artistry? Given exclusively by this museum, the Wrangler is our high, highest honor. I invite all past award winners and inductees to stand and let us honor you with applause. Y'all at that back table, don't let Bob Morehouse out of here with anything. Thank you. You know, we've got another artist in our midst tonight who is certainly noted in our community and across the country. He's former state senator Enoch Kelly Haney. He's a painter and sculptor and the man who crafted the Guardian that all of us in Oklahoma are so proud of standing atop the state capitol. Welcome, Senator Haney. Wave your arm and let us say hi to you. You know, as always, all of us gathered for these awards have a very vital, common interest, and that is preserving the values of our Western way of life. These values define who we are and what we represent, things like honesty and loyalty, courage and perseverance. As always, thank you to all of you for supporting this museum's mission to safeguard those values. Our board of directors guides this museum. We are very fortunate to have a board that is so dedicated and supportive. Would my fellow board members please stand now and allow us to recognize your passion for this museum. Listen, we also want to say thanks to all of our sponsors that are listed in your program and have shown on screen here this evening. Would all of those sponsors please stand up and let us say thanks to you. It is our special honor tonight to have Lou Diamond Phillips and Wyatt McRae, who will co MC the awards program after the dinner. You know, Lou Diamond Phillips is an actor and a director whose breakthrough came in the classic movie La Bamba. But he will always be remembered by Western fans for his portrayal of Chavez in Young Guns. Yeah. You know, acting in film, on television, and on stage, Lou Diamond Phillips has been nominated for both the Golden Globe and the Tony Award. Wyatt McRae is a devoted Westerner, comes from a third generation ranching family, and is the grandson of the most authentic Western actor in Hollywood history, Joel McRae, an inductee to our Hall of Great Western Performers in 1969. Wyatt currently serves on our board of directors. Let's thank these gentlemen for being part of our awards. Folks, you know, our board and our staff have been doing lots of talking about young people and the future of the museum as part of our new master plan. There are many, many examples of how young people today continue to embrace Western lifestyle and ideals. Well, tonight, in a new twist for this event, we've asked two young ladies to lead us in our Pledge of Allegiance. So folks, will you please rise Join me in welcoming Miss Rodeo Oklahoma Sweethearts, eight-year-old Hadley Baker and seven-year-old Fallon Graham. Ladies. Mm -hmm. 
I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, sweethearts. We could probably end the program right now. Listen, these two young ladies were among 20 smart, talented, beautiful young women who competed for their titles on this very stage last July. We think the future is pretty bright indeed. Thank you, ladies. This museum also collaborates with like-minded community partners. One such partner is the Rodeo Opry located in the historic Stockyard districts where every Saturday night music goers can enjoy a great show. Tonight from the Rodeo Opry is to sing our national anthem is Cindy Scarberry. So proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the We're so gallantly streaming And the rocket's red glare The bombs bursting in air Gave proof through the night That our flag was still there Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the Please relax, enjoy your dinner. The 52nd Anniversary Western Heritage Award will begin in about 30 minutes. and gentlemen, please welcome Wyatt McRae. Good evening. Thank you, thank you. Good evening. Welcome to the 52nd Annual Western Heritage Awards from the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum. The premier Western award show in the nation, I might add. Yeah. Go for it. No laser beams, no pyrotechnics, no dancing chickens. 
Just good old fashioned recognition for a job well done. And we are family friendly, I might add. At least that was until we let Patrick Wayne in the building. <laughs> Seriously, it's always an honor for me to be a part of this proud tradition, and tonight is no exception. Before we go any further, let me introduce you to my co-MC for the evening. This man has not only won accolades for his portrayal of iconic roles on the big screen, the small screen, and on Broadway, but he is also one of the most down-to-earth people you'll meet in Hollywood, a gentleman and my friend. Please welcome our co-MC for this evening, Mr. Lou Diamond Phillips. How y'all doing? First of all, I would love to thank our wait staff for that amazing meal and for getting out in a timely fashion. Thank you, guys. Table 407, you can have my dessert. <laughs> uh, and I have to say, as a past recipient, I ain't such a young gun anymore. But uh, I'm incredibly proud and I'm incredibly honored to be here with you guys tonight upholding a tradition that will never die and will never ride away. So we're going to have some fun. Fantastic. You know, Lou, it's a little bit bittersweet standing at this podium tonight and serving as co MC because last year I was joined by one of the finest gentlemen of all time, the great Ernest Borgnine. I just want to tell a really quick story about Ernie. I had the great great pleasure of working uh, with him on a western called Trail to Hope Rose that the Wrangler Awards was uh, uh, kind enough to bestow us with an award and day in and day out on that set that man taught me and everybody else in that cast not only what it was like to be a professional but to be a fine fine human being and you know what Ernie would never go back to the trailer to change his clothes he would say, well, I'm, am, am I just changing my shirt? And we'd say, well, yeah, Ernie, you don't, you, know, you don't have to you know, get in the van and travel back to the trailer. So Ernie would change his shirt on the set almost every single day. And the effect that it had on the young people, let me tell you, after years of therapy, they've finally gotten over it. <laughs> but they knew what a professional and a kind heart that man was. Now, we, we lost Ernie this past year, along with our friends Harry Carey Jr. and Dale Robertson. With the help of actor Barry Corbin, another dear friend of mine, let's take a moment to remember these dear friends. Dale Robertson was the very first host of these awards in 1961. He was a frequent presenter over the years. He was inducted into the Hall of Great Western Performers in 1986. He was a hero of World War II where he won bronze and silver stars. He made more than 60 movies, but is best known for his pioneer work in early television roles like uh, Tales of Wells Fargo and Death Valley Days. Dale always said he only acted to make enough money to own a ranch back home in Oklahoma, where he raised world champion horses and where he lived until his death last month at the age of 89. Harry Carey Jr. was born on a ranch to famous acting parents, but he made his own mark, especially in Westerns. A favorite of legendary director John Ford, he co-starred in 11 John Wayne movies, including She Wore a Yellow Ribbon and The Searchers. He was inducted into the Hall of Great Western Performers in 2003 and was a frequent guest and presenter at these awards. The man friends knew as Dobie loved the Western way of life until his death last December at 91. Ernest Borgnine was a bear of a man, blessed with a gentle soul we got to know and love him during his many trips to this museum. He co-hosted this very event just last year. 
and he entertained us with stories that always seemed to poke fun at himself. And every year, they have, a, uh, they try to find an Ernest Borgnine look-alike. So far, four women have found it. He was also one of the honorees last year. As a producer, probably the smartest thing I did on this movie was hire Ernie Borgnine and tell my guys to point the camera at him and I got out of the way. Ernest Borgnine was in more than 200 feature films, 32 of them westerns, including Sam Peckinpah's classic, The Wild Bunch. He was inducted into the museum's Hall of Great Western Performers in 1996. His brawny, tough guy looks got him the role, made him a star. The sadistic stockade sergeant, Fatso Judson, in 1953's From Here to Eternity. Two years later, he won Hollywood's greatest honor, the Oscar, for his portrayal of a lonely bachelor named Marty. There was Mac Hale's Navy for those who grew up in the 60s. And for the current generations, the voice character of Mermaid Man on SpongeBob SquarePants. But we knew him as a regular guy, a guy with a gap-toothed smile, a big hearty laugh, and whenever he was introduced, he'd always say, it's Ernie, just Ernie. We didn't know it at the time, but last year, we were saying goodbye. You know, Ernie was inducted in 1996, and I think he only missed one year since then. He, he was with us every single year. And always by his side was a lady that was with him for over 30 years, and she always made sure he got here, was dressed right, and was on time. And I'd like to recognize Mrs. Joyce McConnell. You know, we can do Ernie, Doby, and Dale proud tonight as we pay homage to the Western Way by dedicating tonight's show to their memory. One man who lives that life every day is our first presenter. He was inducted into the Hall of Great Westerners in 2003 and has eight Wranglers to his name. Please welcome Red Stegall to present the Chester A. Reynolds Memorial Award, sponsored tonight by Four Sixes Burnett Ranches. And what three great people to follow than the ones you just saw on the screen. We'll miss them, and they contributed greatly to our lives. Museum founder Chester A. Reynolds was a successful businessman who believed strongly in preserving the history of the West. His contribution is memorialized each year with an award named in his honor, which recognizes an individual or group demonstrating commitment to Western ideals and values. And that can be through a single remarkable achievement or a body of a quality work. The man we are now honoring with this award, I'm happy to call my friend. And I treasure all those miles we rode together horseback, all those hours we spent listening to the greatest storyteller I've ever known in my life. And I have a lot of thanks for all those days you babysit me. I really appreciate that, Boots. He's 78 years young and is still throwing a leg over one of those great four sixes bred quarter horses every day to do what he loves to do best, cowboying. Boots O'Neill has always been a cowboy. I've worked outside in all my life in the cold and rain and sleet and snow and I'm in good shape right now and I, I could do whatever I wanted to but money has never been an important thing to me just being able to work and punch cows and uh, has been my life and that's what I enjoy the most. He grew up on a ranch in the Texas Panhandle 
with no electricity, no hot water, and no heat in the winter. Families didn't have any money at that time, you know, just a, a living, you know, and they, uh, uh, kids, I think children now are blessed with so much more. And uh, uh, nearly everyone has a car. And uh, then, why, well, they just, uh, a family like ours, there was eight of us children and uh, mother and dad. And, uh, you know, it's just a, in a survival mode most of the time, you know. And, uh, named Bill like his dad and like his dad nicknamed Boots, he never wanted to be anything but a cowboy. He left high school to start working at his passion, but war came and duty called. He spent two years in Korea before we came home, went back to Cowboy and got his GED along the way. He also found a wife, and a good one. Boots and Nelda would raise a daughter, Lori, and spend 44 blessed years together. He worked as an inspector with the Cattle Raisers Association for a while, and even got a special commission from the world famous Texas Rangers, the ones with the badges, not the bats. But Boots never could get very far away from being a cowboy. He spent almost 50 years of his life working for two of the most famous outfits in Texas, the Wagner Ranch and the Four Sixes. His job, as he likes to say, is turning grass into beef and giving the next generation of cowboys a good education. I like when me and Boots spend about six, five or six hours sitting on the porch listening to him tell old stories about the good old days. and. Uh, I learned more from just listening to him sit around on the porch and talk than I have from anybody else. There might be a right way and a wrong way to do something, but there's also the cowboy way. And that's the way Boots O'Neill has always lived his life. I've had fun every day of my life, you know, my job. I, I look forward to going to work every morning and like now I could retire anytime I wanted to, you know, but uh, I... Uh, like people dread what's going to do tomorrow, I never dread what we're going to do, and I look forward to going to work every morning. Every morning from before dawn till every evening after dark, you're never finished till the job gets done. I have a lot of respect for Boots and all he's done, and he's done a lot for me, and uh, there's a lot of people that have, do respect him a whole lot, and he's a good, just all-around good guy and a good man. A legendary cowboy, a family man, a friend, that's Boots O'Neill. Any great artist who paints a cowboy doing what he loves to do and doing it right, you can recognize Boots O'Neill. He is the ultimate cowboy, a great friend, one of the finest gentlemen I have ever known in my life. And I'm so proud to welcome the Chester A. Reynolds Memorial Award winner, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Boots O'Neill. I'm sure there's a good many out there, like myself, that's wondering how he got this award. But after listening to Red a little while, it makes it a little easier to understand it. <laughs> Thank you, Red. <laughs> but seriously, I uh, have, have been punching cows 65 years this year, and uh, I'm looking forward to what we're going to do there at the ranch Monday morning. I uh, have never had any aspirations to get this kind of an award before, and so I was quite surprised when Red come by the chuck wagon last year and told me we was it, pulled in there by a wood stove and told me that we had been inducted. So uh, I'm very honored. and. Uh, I uh, 
have been blessed to have good health and be able to do it. And uh, Red was really nice to me on the age. I'm 80 and not 78. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, I... Uh, I would like to, to thank my sweet wife, who we lost in 2006 to cancer, for doing most of the leg work on this. Uh, Bob Mars, the saddle maker in Amarillo, uh, told me in 2001 he had recommended me for this award and that I needed to contact a few people and get some letters of recommendation. And that's the last time I ever thought about that because uh, I didn't think to start with that I was probably eligible. And, uh, but Nelda went to work on it. And uh, after she passed away, I found a brochure with a bunch of stuff in her desk and it was copies of letters. And there's a good many of the folks in this audience that was there and uh, that letters were written by. And... Uh, so I asked my daughter, sitting here at the table, what this is, and she said, Mom had been working on this deal, and she started to tell you when she got sick, because you were so low, but she decided to wait till you heard from them. And so I, I uh, am glad that we done that, but I want to recognize her, and then uh, I've got several folks out there. I'm not going to try to name them, you get to make naming names and you leave somebody out and then they're offended, but all of you know, and uh, most of you that, uh, that I know well and have had some influence on me being selected for this, and it's uh, an honor that uh, I, uh, I know that I'm not articulate enough to express what it means to me. And, uh, I might add that I've roped horses out of a 200 horse remuda and not been as nervous as I am with you folks here. So, but uh, <clears throat> I, I was in a, <clears throat> a meeting in Vernon, Texas in 1960 and the, the MC recognized a very distinguished senator in the audience and as a courtesy called on him to come up and say a few words. And I've never forgot what the old gentleman said. He, he got up there and said uh, that he didn't want to get up there and just say a few words and sit down and leave you wondering about the degree of his intelligence as opposed to the guy that stayed up there till he removed all doubt. So <laughs> with that, I'm going to say thank you very much. Boots on Neil. That's what it's all about, isn't it? And we, uh, we're really proud of Boots. Our next induction is sponsored by Encore Releasing and is for the Hall of Great Western Performers. So it's only fitting that our next presenter is the son of John Wayne, who was one of the great Western performers of all time. But Patrick is also an actor in his own right. With 20 Westerns under his belt, please welcome Patrick Wayne. Thank you, Red, and thank you. It's really a pleasure to be here again. It's so great to come back here and visit with old friends. I uh, hope it's not my last trip here, like some of our friends that we memorialized tonight, but. Anyway, it's great to be back here. And I'm here to talk about the Hall of Great Western Performers honors those who have made significant contributions to the perpetuation of Western film, radio, or theater. They embody the ideas of honesty, 
integrity, and self-reliance. Robert Mitchum portrayed those values as well as anyone. He appeared in 31 westerns, including the classic El Dorado, in which he co-starred with my dad. And he did it all with an air of nonchalance that made my dad joke once that Mitch has been retiring ever since the first day I met him. <laughs> my favorite Mitchum story happened one night at a charity gala for the Motion Picture and Television Fund. It was at the end of the evening, and uh, the line of people waiting for their cars at the valet was a mile long, and it wasn't moving. And Mitch says, come with me. So we slid into a little bar in the hotel. There's a piano there. Bob sits down at the piano, and he starts to play, sings the great American songbook into the wee small hours. I mean, who knew? What a surprise. I had no idea he had this talent. It was definitely the highlight of the evening for me. He was just a great guy to be around. Women loved him. Men imitated him. And tonight, we honor him. Robert Mitchum was a lot of things before he became an actor. A troublemaker twice expelled from school. A longshoreman, a ghostwriter for an astrologist, a boxer later encouraged by movie execs to get his nose fixed. More than a third of his films were westerns. He once said, I have two acting styles, one on a horse and one off. His first movie for RKO was a western, but Girl Rush wasn't your typical Mitchum western. You for me, ma'am, I like a fake. Well, now they don't come too big for me either, but... <laughs> Mitchum and co-star Wally Brown were done up and dragged to sneak into a gold mining camp. Mitchum did a string of movies for RKO, spent a year serving during World War II, and came back to gain attention playing a Marine adjusting to life back home until the end of time. You know, we had a friend named Maxie Klein. Maxie was here, he'd probably spit right in your eye. Yeah? Yeah, but Maxie's dead in Bottle Canal. So just for him, I'm gonna spit in your eye. He became a major star after his Oscar-nominated performance of Lieutenant Walker in the 1945 film, The Story of G.I. Joe. One of his best and favorite roles was the evil Reverend Harry Powell in Night of the Hunter. It's love that won, and old left-hand hate is down for the count. He could also play the dashing leading man as in Macau with Jane Russell. Which one of you is Cinderella? Or the likable anti-hero, as in Friends of Eddie Coyle. She used to say, stick your hand out. I stick my hand out, whap, she knocked me across the knuckles. But it is for the Westerns we honor him tonight. Among them, film noir classics like Blood on the Moon. It starts with your double cross and a bunch of poor, jug-headed homesteaders and the hiring of gun hands. It goes on to your making love to a man's daughter to get her to turn against her own father. And good old rough-and-tumble shoot-'em-ups like El Dorado. Now you, Jason, get out of my way. You thought it was pretty funny too, didn't you? Why aren't you laughing now? It's the same drunken sheriff, the same hat, the same outfit. Why don't you laugh? Let me hear you laugh! But to hear Mitchum tell it, acting was just another job, and one at which he never thought he was very good. After a lifetime of watching his films, movie fans would agree he wasn't very good. Robert Mitchum was one of the greatest of all time. Accepting this honor on behalf of the Mitchum family are his children, Chris Mitchum and Patrine Day Mitchum. Come on up. You know, first of all, I have to say how great it is to have my old friend Patrick Wayne here to share this evening with me. Thank you, Patrick. I'd, I'd like to thank the Heritage Museum and all of you for keeping the heritage 
and the traditions of the West alive. You know, our father, his first 14 films were with Hopalong Cassidy. It wasn't until he had a few lines in Hoppy Serves of Writ, uh, where he was billed as henchman, that uh, he finally got some billing. The first day on the job, as legend has it, they asked him, can you ride a horse? And he said, sure. Never been on a horse in his life. <laughs> so when it was time to, to mount up, he was a bit skittish. So he took the horse behind the building, hit it as hard as he could, and said, I need this job. <laughs> Got on the horse, rode out. At the end of the day, the wrangler came up to me. He said, you know, I didn't think you were going to be able to sit him. He said, the guy you replaced? That horse killed him yesterday. You're wearing his hat. <laughs> a year later, he lassoed his first leading role as Jim Lacey in the Western Nevada. And that time, he was mounted on one of the greatest movie horses of all time, a beautiful quarter horse called Steel. He rode like the wind into stardom, and he never looked back. So, Dad, came a long way. This is for you. Thank you very much. To present our first group of literary awards, welcome John Wayne's granddaughter, Anita LaCava Swift, and a man remembered for his starring roles in TV westerns such as Laramie and Wagon Train, Robert Fuller. This year's award for outstanding juvenile book goes to the Quilt Walk. Written by Sandra Dallas, published by Sleeping Bear Press, and sponsored by Ellen Bick. It's 1864, and 10 year old Emmy Blue and her pioneering parents are preparing to relocate to Colorado. During her final goodbye, Emmy Blue's grandma gives her a supply of small bits of fabric. Concerned that the Colorado Territory is no place for a proper young lady, Grandma is determined Emmy Blue must learn to sew. The girl's long journey west becomes a quilt walk and a life-changing experience for her and her family. Here to accept the Wrangler Award for Outstanding Juvenile Book is author Sandra Dallas. My husband Bob and I were married 50 years ago today. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that back then we weren't planning on uh, spending our 50th anniversary in Oklahoma City. <laughs> but after this wonderful anniversary party you've thrown for us, we wouldn't want to be anywhere else. <laughs> I've changed in 50 years. And I suspect the museum has too. I'm not sure that back then it would have given this award to a book that includes domestic violence, lack of options for women, and quilting. But we've changed, and we recognize that the West is a big tent, and that diversity adds to its richness. This is my second Wrangler Award, to win one is a blessing to win two is a state of grace. Thank you to the National Cowboy Museum for this honor, and thank you, Bob, for our life together. This year's Wrangler winner for Outstanding Western Novel is D.B. Jackson and his gripping work, Unbroke Horses, by Gold Mines Publishing. The gritty story of three Civil War deserters, void of all virtue and living on the fringe of humanity. They kidnap a young boy with sole purpose of drafting him into their band of misfits. His sole chance for redemption lies with an old Indian horse trainer and a small band of unbroke horses. 
Here to accept the award for Outstanding Western Novel are author Dan Johnson and Stephen Anderson of Gold Mines Publishing. Dale Jackson. Jackson, sorry. What a great honor and a debt of gratitude to the museum for uh, being this rock around which we can uh, do this work that we do, this, the creative process of honoring the uh, American cowboy and the American Indian. Now, a special debt of gratitude to my beautiful wife, Mary, who's so much a part of everything I write, <clears throat> and my son, Josh, who grew to be the man that I aspire to be. Thank you guys so much. <clears throat> In terms of the book, I'd like to also acknowledge <clears throat> a good friend, a cowboy and an actor, who in his iconic role in a cult film classic called The Journeyman, Brad Hunt, who looked across the barrel of his smoking nickel-plated 45, and he whispered these words, people remember evil long after they've forgotten good. People definitely remembered evil. Well, that haunted me for the first 200 pages of the book, <clears throat> and. Uh, Fortunately for me and for anybody who buys the book, my wife came to the rescue and said, you can't do this to that protagonist. You've got to get this kid out of trouble. So that was the last 100 pages. Thank you very much. Thank you to Pat Labruto, the editor who is such a master storyteller and a great friend, and especially to Stephen Anderson and Gold Mines Publish, Publishing, who believed in this book uh, from concept to completion. Stephen, thank you so much. When I first met D.B. Jackson, um, I knew fairly quickly he was somebody I liked and would like to work with. But uh, after I read his manuscript, not only did I want to publish him, but I knew that here before me was one of the next great voices in the Western genre. And I remember, never forget the day when Pat Labruto, the editor I hired to work with Jackson, called me after his first read of Unbroke Horses and Liberto was a veteran in the publishing business in New York. He worked with the Louis L'Amour estate and many others. And the first word out of his mouth was, wow. Being here tonight is a testament to us at Gold Mines that we can publish a book like Unbroke Horses and let the reading world decide for itself just how remarkable a book it is. It's definitely one of the highlights of my career. And I was right. D.B. Jackson is great to work with. And I... I can't think of a more appropriate award for him because D.B. Jackson is not just a talented writer, he's a true Westerner. And I will never forget that about him and that's one of the reasons I love working with him and I can't thank the Western Heritage Museum enough for honoring him tonight. So thank you very much. by Mike and Lori Dickinson is Outstanding Nonfiction Book. This year's award winner is author Robert M. Utley for his captivating work, Geronimo, published by the Yale University Press. More than a hundred years ago after his death, Geronimo still captivates fans of the American West. A narrative by this celebrated historian and author draws upon new historical resources to shed life on the famous warrior's life. Employing the alternating as aspects of whites and Apaches, Utley paints an authentic portrait of a warrior with unique strengths and weaknesses. Accepting the award for outstanding nonfiction book, Robert Utley and Christopher Rogers from Yale U University Press. I have only three things to say during my allotted two minutes. <clears throat> First, I have participated in many award ceremonies. 
Of course, I'm honored to receive a Wrangler. But I will say that this ceremony, and I have participated in three, is far superior to any other ceremony. And I, I honor not only this institution, but I thank them for my fourth Wrangler. Second, this is the toughest book I ever did. And I won't tell you why, but I will tell you, being an egoist as I am, that I think I have captured the real Geronimo better than anyone has or will. Third, I would not be standing here tonight getting some help to carry that Wrangler off were it not for Chris Rogers, my editor at Yale University Press. I have done 17 books. I have never had a greater editor than Chris Rogers. And I thank him because that Wrangler and that one, <laughs> he deserves. Thank you. I am very humbled by Bob's words, and uh, I've been an editor in publishing for 30 odd years now, and uh, this is uh, just a real high for me. I really enjoyed working with Bob on this book. Um, Geronimo was a ghost, a uh, very difficult guy to really nail down on, the, on paper, and the primary sources were very difficult to uh, manage and, and pull together to, to tell a story. And, and Bob did a remarkable job. I mean, uh, this book is, is, you know, just a wonderful uh, feel for who this man was. So uh, the highlight of my career uh, is uh, working on this book with Bob. And I truly thank you all for this great honor. Thank you. Our next award is sponsored by NBC Oklahoma. It's presented for the outstanding magazine article, The Other Trail, written by Jim Logan and appearing in the March-April 2012 edition of Oklahoma Today magazine. The writer chronicles the Great Western Cattle Trail, which stretched nearly 1,500 miles from South Texas through Dodge City, Kansas, and nearly to the Canadian border. Some found adventure and some made their fortunes along the trail as cowboys prodded more than 7 million head of cattle north in some of the most difficult working conditions ever known in the American West. Here to accept the Wrangler for Outstanding Magazine article are writer Jim Logan and editor Steffi Corcoran. it up and it's probably a very bad idea for the editor to speak before the writer but we like to do things our own way at Oklahoma today. Um, 
We're a 57-year-old publication, and this is our very first Wrangler Award. So we are beyond honored and humbled to receive this. Uh, thank you so much to the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum. Uh, it's a little daunting to be up here in this esteemed gathering where I have only sat as a media representative in the past. So excuse me if my breath catches a little bit. I'd like to quickly thank um, our very supportive parent agency in the state, which is the Oklahoma Tourism and Recreation Department. Wonderful leadership by Debbie Snodgrass and Dick Dutton. Of course, all the Oklahoma Today staff, freelance and full time. And I'd be very remiss if I did not thank the gentleman to my left. A few years ago, I pulled a manuscript, excuse me, about Temple Houston out of what we call the slush pile. And it was one of the best things I ever did because Jim's been writing for us ever since and he is a star. I'm gonna let him have the mic now and thank you so much. Thank you, Steffi. I'd like to express my gratitude to the organizers and the judges of the Western Heritage Awards, the great people at Oklahoma Today Magazine, publisher Joan Henderson, art director Stephen Walker, and their superb editor, Steffi Corcoran, who was the first to take a chance on me. I'd like to sh thank Shane Bevel for his exceptional photography on the piece, Randy Butler and Jason Redd of the Butler Red Ranch out west, Joe Britton and Udell Barton of the Western Cattle Trail Association. And I'd like to pay a tribute to two teachers who made a difference in my life early on. My junior high history teacher, the late Quanta Cox of Duncan, Oklahoma, the grandson of the great Comanche chief, Quanta Parker, and my Weatherford High School English teacher, Miss Maureen Stuckey, who taught me how to diagram a sentence. All of them. All of my grandparents and great-grandparents are buried along the Western Cattle Trail. One actually wrote it as a young man, so it was with some sense of connection that I came to the story. My two daughters, Jill and Ann, both as beautiful inside and out as their mother have come to be with me this evening from Tennessee and Iowa. We lost their mother uh, in the spring of 2011 to leukemia. For a long while after that, I didn't write anything. The trail article was the first thing written after losing her. It's to the memory of my daughter's mother and my wife and trail mate of 36 years, Colleen, that I would like to dedicate this most treasured award tonight. Thank you. Congratulations. You guys having any fun yet? All right. We're glad to welcome to the stage a man who is clearly qualified to present the Wranglers for the best in Western music. He has been here on the stage many times before to entertain and to pick up his five Wranglers. Michael Martin Murphy has had multiple hit singles and six gold albums. Please say hello to Michael Martin Murphy. You know that music? That's a waltz. Remember waltzes? Well, every year we put on a cowboy Christmas ball right here at the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum. And we have a lot of waltzes because I love waltzes. And let me tell you why I love waltzes. I like playing them, I like singing them, and it discourages line dancing. You know, Brother Murphy's doing everything he can to stamp out that practice. I like dancing with the person, you know, not 10 feet apart from the person, so. 
That's a great one too, that waltz. It's played beautifully by multiple Wrangler winner, Rich O'Brien. Rich. Okay, how about some traditional music? In 2010, the Gillette Brothers won the Wrangler for Outstanding Traditional Western Music Album. And this year, they're picking up another one for their new song, Trade Off, this year's outstanding original composition. Trade Off was penned by a well-known cowboy poet, Waddy Mitchell. Friends, I'm just gonna get off the script here for a minute and tell you that it's not possible for us to have enough time to talk about what Waddy Mitchell has done for cowboy poetry and for Western tradition. He's what they call a native genius. And the Gillette Brothers are well-loved musical troubadours whose recordings feature a compelling blend of traditional cowboy music. If you attended the Jingle Jangle Mingle last night, you heard why this outstanding original composition won. Guy, Pip, and Waddy, come on up here and get your Wrangler awards. Well, thank you. I'd like to thank the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum. It's indeed an honor and a thrill. Just delighted to be here. Uh, one of our favorite, my favorite artists, Western artists, is uh, Charlie Russell. And it occurred to me that uh, if Charlie Russell were a poet, he'd be Waddy Mitchell. <laughs> and uh, just wanted to thank Waddy for writing a great song. And I'd like to thank our producer, Chris Gage, in Austin, Texas, for uh, helping us out uh, recording the album and uh, playing on it and producing it. Thank you. Waddy uh, wrote a great song, and Pip did a wonderful job of singing it, and I was just delighted to be able to play some guitar on it. And we, uh, I sure want to thank you all very much. Thank you, folks, really. This is, uh, you know, somebody had mentioned a while ago, this is the very best of, of the things, of award shows. If anybody saw the Grammys or the uh, Academy Awards on your television sets, you'll know he's right. Guy, thanks for leaving this kind of set down here where I live. Appreciate that. Blessed with a one-of-a-kind voice and a spirited cowboy soul, Bill Barwick is this year's recipient of the Outstanding Traditional Western Music Album. You know, Bill is on a lot of festivals and he travels all over the country just working really hard for the traditional Western sound. The album that he made that won this award is called The Usual Suspects. And it was produced by Jim Ratz and sponsored by Bue Harris. And by the way, I want to mention that Jim has his dad here tonight. I met earlier and it was an honor to meet him. He was a dust bowl survivor and he's 98 years old and he walked in here tonight. <laughs> One of America's most respected Western music performers and a finalist for the Western Music Association Entertainer of the Year, three times in a row, Bill Barwick has been hailed as a Cowboys Cowboy singer for his distinctive singing, songwriting, and storytelling. The Usual Suspects is his ninth solo album, and it features his deep, rich voice, which I have to, I'd have to take a lot of testosterone replacement to get down there. Here to accept the award for Outstanding Western Album, welcome Bill Barwick and Jim Ratz. <laughs> Good evening to you, mister. 
bounty hunter said, you don't know me. Howdy. <laughs> Coming up tonight on the Westerns Channel. For 20 years, you've been listening to me. I know. You thought I'd be bigger. There's a pretty young lady down here at the table with us that I need to say a special thank you to. Her name is Sam DeLue, and I sure do appreciate all of her love and support. I know that thank you don't sound like much, but I sure do mean it. I want to thank this handsome gentleman next to me. Jim Ratz has been working with me, or I've been working with him, however that works out. This is our ninth album project together. All I do is sit and play guitar and sing. God, he makes me sound good. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome my partner, Mr. Jim Ritz. Thank you very much. I'd just like to say that the job of a producer is hopefully to be successfully an appendage for a visionary and their vision. And of course, playing the part of the visionary is Bill Barwick. And I'd like to thank the Western Heritage Museum for honoring our 20 years of working together. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, that's the one I want. That's the one you want. Good evening to you, mister. Bounty Hunter said, you don't know me, but the, I know the, 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 new, the New Horizons Award. <laughs> the New Horizons Award is given to a recording artist or band in the first five years of their career. The Wrangler goes to Miss Devon and the Outlaw for where in the Dickens are you? <laughs> now... Miss Devon is Devon Dawson, a top Western music entertainer who was voted Female Performer of the Year in 2009 by the Academy of Western Artists. That's Academy of Western Artists, not country. People, people often ask me what's the difference between Western music and country music, and the answer is Western music is really good. Her signature sock rhythm guitar, and I've been on stage with her, and believe me, she can, you don't need a drummer when she's playing the guitar. Her sock rhythm guitar and warm Western swing vocals have landed her performances throughout the West, as well as a Grammy certificate for her talents as the singing, yodeling voice of Jessie the Yodeling Cowgirl in the Walt Disney Woody's Roundup. Now, the outlaw is Jesse Robertson, and I, virtue, I, I, I would just venture to say I met Jesse quite a few years ago on a trail ride in Arizona, and there's no way that, that Jesse would have ever expected to be up here today. He was a guy that just wanted to play a few cowboy songs, and now he's winning the Wrangler Award. He's known for morphing into at least a dozen different personalities during a typical performance. I tend to murph, he tends to morph. <laughs> and he's here to accept his Wrangler, and so is Miss Devin. Please make welcome Miss Devin and the Outlaw, Jesse Robertson. I was riding old Dan out on the Texas plains when I heard the chugging of a passenger train. And as he chugged along, the steam was hissing, keeping perfect rhythm with the train. Wow, this is amazing. The first time I ever performed at the, at the Cowboy Hall of Fame was with Riders in the Sky with my red hat in Jesse costume as a guest. So that was wonderful. But I, I think this is even better, isn't it, Outlaw? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I want to thank Teresa Burleson sitting right over there, great cowgirl poet whose idea it was to write this song. Kristen Harris, my young protege, fast rising star in Western music, contributed. And we, we three CFFs, cowgirl friends forever, wrote the song and completed it without any help from Jesse until he woke up from his nap. 
And he complained, and about a week later, he, uh, he came out with his version, the reply. So it's a whole bunch of fun. I want to thank my husband, Chuck Wagon Chuck, who puts up with everything, rides the, drives the bus, carries the gear, does the sound. <laughs> thank you, Chuck. 38 years, my hubby. <laughs> And Mr. Rich O'Brien, without whom this project could never have been as fine. Now, Rich wanted to come tonight, but he could not make it. So he wanted me to tell you how he loves each and every single one of you. So here's to more good stuff from Rich. Did you want to say something? That's hard with you, Ram. <laughs> I just want to reiterate what she said, the name she mentioned. This is my first time to do anything like this, so I'm kind of scared. Actually, I'm not. I'm an outlaw. Yeah, there you go. And an outlaw has to go into different, you know, venues, and he's got to be different people. So sometimes I get to be Walter Brennan. You know, <laughs> when I get to walk in there, people don't know who I am, really. <laughs> or, or I can even go in there and be somebody like, you know, Mr. Haney used to be on Green Acres. <laughs> he used to do all kinds of things for Mr. Douglas, you know, just to make a little money. But uh, my favorite guy to be... Because he sounds more like an outlaw than anybody. It's Yosemite Sam, because, boy, I like old Yosemite. It's Yosemite. Come on. I can't say Yosemite. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much. Angler. Thank you to the Cowboys. Yeah, thank y'all to the Western Heart. Thank you. And now, please welcome back Waddy Mitchell and an actor, Olympic gold medalist, Pro football player, stuntman, and 2007 Director's Award winner, Dean Smith. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, it's your talk. You know, Dean, now that you're the subject of this new fancy biography, what do they call that cowboy stuntman from Olympic gold to silver screen, I think, ain't it? I guess so. That kind of means you've done just about everything in this whole deal, maybe, huh? Or, except, you know, dress drag, you know, with somebody like <laughs> Maureen O'Hara or something, you know. Well, actually, Waddy, I have done that, and there's a photo to prove it. Boy, was Maureen O'Hara. <laughs> Boy, Maureen O'Hara was a beauty. My wife, Debbie, tells me it's always quick to tell people that I was not. <laughs> Speaking of beauty, the beauty of the American West has been an inspiration for artists for centuries. Sunsets that make your heart stop, mountain tops that take your breath away, and cowboys that work the land, all captured by the artist's brush. In fact, this museum houses what I consider the best Western art collection in the world. It is an honor. It is an honor to celebrate the, those who have dedicated their lives to such work. For this year's outstanding art book, the Wrangler Award is sponsored by Jerry and Ray Winchester and is presented to Adam Duncan Harris for his work in editing Bob Coon, Drawing on Instinct published by the University of Oklahoma Press. The book offers up generous samplings of Bob Kuhn's rarely seen sketches alongside the vibrant paintings for which he is best known. The book is lavishly illustrated and a fitting tribute. Curator and editor Adam Duncan Harris provides a compelling look at an amazing blend of the artist's finished paintings and his finest sketches. Accepting the award for the Outstanding Art Book, Adam Duncan Harris and Byron Price from the University of Oklahoma Press. I'm glad someone else brought out a list uh, before I got up here because this was truly a collaborative effort and there's lots of people to thank. Um, first of all, I'd like to dedicate this award to the memory of Bob Kuhn who provided us with so much great material with which to work. Without him, of course, uh, the whole book and the project wouldn't have been possible. Also to the Kuhn family for their incredible um, collaboration and cooperation with this project. 
Um, without them, we couldn't have done it. Our sponsors, um, who many of you are familiar with, Lynn and Foster Freeze, um, helped underwrite the book, as well as members of the Kuhn Memorial Fund. Um, I'd also like to thank, of course, the University of Oklahoma Press, Byron Price and Charles Rankin in particular, and Byron will be up here in a second to say a few words. Um, this uh, project germinated from the National Museum of Wildlife Art um, without the support of Bill and Jaffa Kerr and their deep appreciation for the work of Bob Kuhn. Uh, again, we wouldn't have had the great material with which to work. Um, I was the editor of this book. I provided an essay, and I had to wrangle a bunch of other folks to help me with it, so I'm going to list off some of them. We had essayists, including Lisa Strong, James Nottage, Amy Scott, and Todd Wilkinson, as well as some of Bob's friends, and probably some of your friends as well, artists Ken Bunn, George Carlson, Ken Carlson, George McLean, Howard Turpening, and Kent Ulberg. Thanks so much to all of them. I'd also thank, like to thank the National Museum of Wildlife Art for letting me do these projects. Um, our president and CEO, Jim McNutt, is here with us tonight. Um, we've got many of their friends and Kuhn supporters out here this evening. I know the McCloys are back there, and I'd like to give them a special thank for all their help. And thank you so much also to the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum for this beautiful award. I'm sure Bob would have been very proud. Over the last 80 plus years, the University of Oklahoma Press has published uh, many very fine books on um, the American West. Uh, we've never published one any better than Drawing on Instinct. Thank you very much to the Cowboy Museum, to the National Museum of Wildlife Art, and to our editor, Chuck Rankin, uh, who couldn't be here this evening to uh, join uh, with us in celebrating this uh, wonderful event. Thanks very much. I have a great appreciation for this year's Wrangler winner for Outstanding Photography Book, which is sponsored by Belger Cartridge Service and awarded to National Geographic Books, Greatest Photographs of the American West, capturing 125 years of majesty, spirit, and adventure. The creators are Rich Clarkson and James McNutt. This rich photographic collection is a well, a visual journey through history of the American West drawn upon a rare bunch of photographs. This beautiful piece chronicles the epic history and the grandeur of this West. Let's welcome award winners Rich Clarkson, James McNutt, and editor Susan Strait with National Geographic Books for their outstanding photography book. Rich says this was a good idea, and we did have this idea about six years ago when we were sitting around at lunch, and, and we said we ought to do something that could open an exhibit in a bunch of museums around the country all on one day, like the movies, and we ought to do it with a big, great organization like National Geographic. And we did that, and we are very proud to have all of this happen with so many good institutions, including the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum as one of our partners that showed the exhibit and also has helped us do great work with the book and National Geographic books. I want to thank uh, my wife, whom I'm under instructions not to thank Laura, but she gets it all done the right way. And I want to thank Rich Clarkson as a great partner and all the team at his shop. I want to thank our designer, Kate Brainerd, who did a fantastic job and worked hard through all of this. Adam Duncan Harris, who just received the previous award, was one of our curatorial team for the exhibit and the book. And I want to thank Susan Strait and National Geographic Books for all of their tremendous work in this and the whole National Geographic Society and the magazine and the people in the image collection that did a great job. I want to thank the 
Mays Family Foundation that underwrote the project. And I want to thank all of the Museums West, of which Chuck and I are honored members of a great bunch of museums that have lots of things to say and say it in so many ways to so many people. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Susan, has a few other things to say, but thank you very much. Thank you to the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Awards M Museum for this award, for this wonderful award. Um, we're thrilled to be able to bring these images to the general public, and um, they are drawn from the National Geographic Photographic Collection of Asta Archive, and we feel captures the heart and soul of the American West. Our photographers, including Sam Abel, Bill Allard, and many others, are especially grateful to have their work acknowledged with this very meaningful award. Thank you. So they already thanked everyone I was going to, so I, I don't have to. Now let me tell you how these things happen. You know, years ago, I hired this young photographer from the University of Oregon to come to work for me at the Topeka Capital Journal, where he won Newspaper Photographer of the Year the next year. Then he kind of went on and started doing other things. I ended up at the National Geographic as Director of Photography, so I hired him again. And he came to work there, and he was the magazine photographer of the year, subsequently. So right after that, I decided I'm going to start my own publishing company and start to do all these kinds of things that I really want to do without having to go to meetings all day. <laughs> and so Chris Johns became editor-in-chief of the National Geographic magazine. So when Jim McNutt came to me with the idea of doing all of this thing, I made one inquiry to Chris Johns, the National Geographic, he says, you have our archives. Now, what that really means is that Kate and I had the ball of our lives going through 125 years of the collection that has the greatest high quality photography of the American West that exists today. So for us, it was a ball. We loved it. Thank you for the award. How's everybody holding up? Did you guys get some dessert? Well, I didn't. Anyway, <laughs> hey, you know, I, some of you might know that I host uh, an officer in a movie on the Military Channel. So uh, at this moment, I know the Western Heritage Museum and the Wrangler Awards would certainly like to take a moment to remember and to respect our men and women in uniform who are out there defending our way of life and protecting America today. Thank you for your service. God bless you. In this day and age with everything that's happening out there, let's never forget. Let us never forget. We are now ready to present the first Wranglers this evening in the TV and film category. Presenting the awards is last year's Hall of Great Western Performers inductee, whose roles as an actor have taken him to the Western frontier and the final frontier. But he always comes back to the cowboy, making nearly 20 Westerns on the big and small screens. Please welcome Mr. Bruce Boxleitner. <laughs> Good to be back here again. Um, I have the honor of uh, announcing the winners for a little medium that I happen to have some personal experience with, uh, television and films. And produced for the History Channel by Think Factory Media, this Wrangler winner depicts the story of the bitter feud between the iconic Hatfield and McCoy families. It's a true American story of a legendary family feud, one that spanned decades and nearly launched a war between Kentucky and West Virginia. Hatfields and McCoys, a three-part miniseries, showcases an all-star cast led by Kevin Costner and Bill Paxton. 
It chronicles a clash of clans that inspired passion, vengeance, courage, sacrifice, crimes, and accusations, while forever transforming the two families and the region where they lived. The outstanding docudrama goes to the creators of Hatfields McCoys, who are unable to be here this evening. So, they should have. Anyway, <laughs> I'll be glad to accept it for them. I wasn't in it, of course, but that's all right. Um, next in the category for television feature film, the Wrangler goes to, and I'm very proud of this, Shadow on the Mesa, produced by Larry Levinson and my very, very good friend, Lincoln Logason. It's directed by David S. Cass, Sr. and made for the Lifetime Channel. The Wrangler is sponsored by Mr. and Mrs. Brent Cummings. And I believe this is Mr. Logason coming right here. Thank you very much, Bruce. Um, thank you, everybody. On uh, behalf of my cast and crew, I would like to thank the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum for this unbelievable honor. Um, what a, a great opportunity to be here on this night, in this building, in this room. Um, very, very proud. I know that there are some of us in Hollywood that sometimes get a bad rap, and uh, deservedly so, but you can all be very well rest assured that there are still some of us in Hollywood that value a Western way of life, and every time we get the opportunity to depict that on film and television, we're dang sure going to do it. Thank you all very much. Come up here, doing, buddy. Bruce? I'm doing great. Good to see My you, God. buddy. Folks, this is one of the best Western performers we've got living today. Bruce and I did a western together <laughs> out there in California yeah, called uh, Hope Ranch about some guys trying to get some inner city kids to learn how to be cowboys. We were unsuccessful. Yes, we but were. <laughs> we did try. <laughs> yes, it was. Anyway, <laughs> take it away, Bruce. Longmire wins the Wrangler for the outstanding fictional drama sponsored by Mr. and Mrs. Mike Nicola. It is a contemporary crime thriller set in big sky country and a hit TV series on the A&E network. Inspired by Craig Johnson's books, the series stars Robert Taylor, huh? <laughs> Katie Sackhoff, Lou Diamond Phillips, and Bailey Chase. It's the story of Walt Longmire, a dedicated county sheriff in Wyoming, coming to grips with the untimely death of his wife. Turning his life around, he often confides in his close friend, Henry Standing Bear, played, of course, by our host, Lou Diamond Phillips. Hey, Lou, come on out here and pick up your Wrangler Award, huh? Hey, Barry. I got to tell you a story about Lou. Well, too late. Uh, first of all, it's an absolute pleasure and an honor to be standing on the stage with these two gentlemen. One I've worked with, one I've yet to work with, but I've known for a long time, so we've got to make that happen. Uh, this is the third Wrangler that I've had the honor to be a part of, uh, and I am incredibly proud and honored to, to be a part of this tradition, to be a part of your family. That's what I'm doing here tonight. Uh, I certainly accept this award on behalf of uh, our amazing cast, Robert Taylor, who plays Walt Longmire, Katie Sackhoff, Bailey Chase, Adam Bartley, Cassidy Freeman. Uh, we have a lot of fun out in Santa Fe because there's not a lot else to do. <laughs> but I also have to say that our producers, um, Greer Shepard, perhaps the best producer I have ever worked with, and that's saying something because I've been around for about 30 years, uh, our writers, uh, John Coveney and Hunt Baldwin, who have captured Craig Johnson's novels, 
Uh, they do an amazing job and one of the best damn crews I've ever had the pleasure to drink coffee with on the set in the morning. And you'll all be very happy to know that a, that a bunch of those old farts from Young Guns are working on Longmire. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. We dragged him out of the bars and got him back on the set, and so now they're making Longmire. Um, one of the things that I will say, uh, I've read all of nine uh, uh, Craig Johnson's novels, The Longmire Mysteries. If you haven't read them, check them out. They're amazing. He just won another award for Best Novel of the Year uh, uh, earlier this year in Colorado. But this series, this show, truly truly stands for what all of you stand for, for what the Wrangler Awards stand for, for a tradition that is, is not retro, it's not old-fashioned, it, it, it is as current and as relevant today as it ever was. You just have to look at the landscape of America and see what's going on. I'm very proud to be a part of a series where we have characters who stand for something, who stand for honesty, who stand for integrity, they have a moral compass. They stand up for justice. And if they give you their handshake, you know it's going to be done. And uh, thank you. Thank you for recognizing that. We're a young series. Back on the air May 27th this year. Uh, thank you. God bless you. And mount up, regulators. Now, for our next induction into the Hall of Great Westerners, sponsored by Express Employment Professionals, please welcome a Paniolo cowboy historian and a member of our board of directors. Say aloha to Dr. Billy Bergen. Let my opening words be aloha from the far, far west. But Hawaii is part of it all, part of the great American history, part of the great livestock industry. And tonight, I'm very humble and honored to be that person to forward the name for the induction of KLE into the Hall of Great Westerners. Our great leader, the charismatic, silver-haired Chuck Schroeder invoked a term this evening that I want to recall, and he recalled it 52 years ago. This evening was the birth of these wonderful gatherings as we enjoy tonight. But it was 52 years ago that a gentleman rancher, a prominent leader, was inducted into the Hall of Great Westerners, and that was Mr. Wes Eid of California. Tonight, we will induct his direct son, K.L. Eid, a man of very broad talent, of huge contribution to the industry, and a fellow that left such an imprint on his sons, on the ranching community, and the broad image of agriculture in a very positive way. We have to remember that the Eid family at a point in time emigrated from Cornwall, Cornish, England, and the original fellow was Joseph Eid, who had Wes Eid, who in turn had a pair of sons. From that point forward, K.L. Eid carried the reins of the outfit and excelled in so many forms beyond just ranching. I'll give you some examples. In banking, he wasn't just a director of a major agricultural bank, but he invoked the talent and responsibility of outreach before we really invented the term. And it was many a young ranchers who struggled to find the financing to build the beginning of their kingdom that was definitely benefited by the kind and enduring advice of K.L. Eid. We have to remember that as we 
view back to many of our ancestors who had to fight their way through some of our country's toughest times. And with a great, great pleasure, we will tonight honor a friend, a great Westerner, in the very highest sense of the word. His given name was Kenneth, but everybody called him KL. His family was among the earliest to cross the Rockies into California. They settled into Monterey County where KL and his brother Harold learned ranching from their father, Wes. KL was born a cowboy, a cowboy with style, who was blessed to have his wife Helene at his side for more than 60 years. He helped lead his family through the worst of times thanks to innovation and good common sense. During drought when grass was sparse, he took advantage of the irrigated farm fields around Salinas and fed cold produce to his herds. Later he bought some of that land and started growing his own produce to help make ends meet. He also pioneered methods of gravity flow to get water from moisture rich areas to ranch lands drying up from drought, turning adversity into advantage. Kale also helped his fellow ranchers struggling through hard times by spending 39 years on the Federal Land Bank Board of Directors. He had a great sense of responsibility that moved him well beyond concerns for his own interests. And much like his father, who is also a member of the Hall of Great Westerners, he had a big heart and he gave generously of his time, his money, and his knowledge. He was honored many times over the years for his contributions to the cattle industry and was proud that his children and grandchildren followed him into the business. KLE not only carried on, but expanded the traditions and values of one of the great families of the West, a true portrait of success. Some of you may logically wonder why a person such as myself from the very far west would be so honored to introduce this, this induction. But I want you to know that 35 years ago, the cattle industry of Hawaii lost its only packing house and feedlot. And that meant anywhere from 75 to 80,000 calves had to leave that state. Now, I know that's a small number compared to what the industry in continental U.S. is accustomed to, but to us, it was our way of life. And it was the Eid people that sent to Hawaii a permanent buyer. The presence of the Eid name in the cattle industry of Hawaii over the last 35 years is used in a heroic and revered tone for the fact that in good times and bad times, for the blooming calves and the challenged calves, they were there to help us find a market and our home for our calves. The state of Hawaii, its industry, passes very deep aloha to the name Eid because of that. Now the fun part comes when we have Hannah Eid and her fine young five-year-old son, Kenneth Eid. Little Kenneth Eid is five, but he's the sixth generation lineal Eid in the business. While it's hard to speak for another person, I know my grandfather would have been just thrilled to be inducted into the Hall of Great Westerners. His father, Wes, was in, in it, as you know, and he never tired of pointing that out. <laughs> um, my, I'd like to exp express our deepest gratitude and appreciation of my family to all those responsible for, for including him here tonight with all of these fine people inducted tonight and those that came before. Just, it means the world, and I know it would have meant so much to him, and it's very exciting for little Kenny, too. Thank you. Do 
to present our final induction into the Hall of Great Westerners, sponsored by Belger Cartage Service. Please welcome back Chuck Schroeder. Thank you. The National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum was established as, quote, a memorial to the men and women who built the West. Tonight, I think we honor a man that our founders had in mind. He's first a darn sure cowboy. He rides his own horses, he sorts his own replacements, he sends his own dog to the pickup. He's eaten the beans with the bow flies, he's cussed the drought, he's cussed the markets, and he's been thankful for the life that he lives in good country, with good people and good livestock. But he's also a builder. Yes, he built his ranch, he built his remuda, he built his cow herd. But he's also been an innovative leader in building the livestock industry. Rather than just complaining about the animal rightists or the economic leftists or the folks who won't help make things better, he has instead been the leader who could bring people together and work toward a brighter tomorrow, even when that wasn't the popular thing to do. He's an effective leader because he is both respected and he is trusted. The Code of the West is not an interesting set of inspiring platitudes to the fellow we're honoring tonight. It defines the way he sees the world. It defines the way he makes his decisions. It defines the way he treats his fellow man. He is indeed a great Westerner. Dawn hasn't quite reached the high desert in this part of California, but John Lacey and his son Mark are already going to work. They are the third and fourth generations of their family to make their living off the fertile valleys of East Central California. It is not something they take for granted. The Lacey family has been involved in ranching and preserving the cowboy way of life on the land they love since just after the Civil War. You know, my grandparents came out here uh, from Missouri and settled in the Owens Valley at Fort Independence where my son lives today in about 1867. Uh, he came out and followed the mines out and uh, be got involved in agriculture. Today, Lacey Livestock and its partner Centennial Livestock either own or lease more than a quarter million acres of ranch land. They raise cattle and they raise horses, quarter horses. They've developed some of the best herds to be found anywhere on the planet and have been awarded the AQHA's Best Remuda Award. The land is precious to John Lacey and his family. They recently placed more than 7,000 acres into a conservation easement, preserving the land's use for agriculture, not housing subdivisions. And he's not only preserved one of the oldest scales and corrals in California ranching, he still uses them. This ranch here is pretty historic because it was the only scale in the valley for over a hundred, almost a hundred years. And the cattle were weighed here, they were slaughtered here and processed, and then they were taken out to the mines out in Bodie. Though he loves the land, John hasn't spent as much time on it as he'd probably like. He's the only person to serve as president of both the National Cattlemen's Association and the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. He's also served on the boards of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and the National Livestock and Meat Board. Some years, he's been on the road and away from the ranches for all but a couple of months out of the year. Even his wife, Dee, is a past national president of the Cattlemen's Beef Board. Beef's my life. It has been uh, for 65 years, much as I hate to admit it, but uh, it's, it's been a great business for us. It's, uh, it's my dad always said, you know, it, it's given us all an education. Uh, it's given us all a great family life. It's kept us outdoors, which we like. And it's kept us working in physically good condition because you do have to work. And, and we just enjoy it. A life's work continuing on 
in the finest traditions of the Old West. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming John Lacey, a gentleman, a cowboy, and a doggone sure westerner. Ladies and gentlemen of this great event this evening, I have a lot to be thankful for. First, I'd uh, like to thank Chuck Schroeder, a friend of many years now, that came by chance where we've backed up to the fires and jumped in the cold water to get out of whatever thing we were uh, trying to tell people was better for them when they didn't believe it was worth a damn. I'd like to thank uh, the National Cowboys and Heritage Museum for this opportunity, for this great event, and for all the wonderful things that they've accomplished. I need to thank uh, many numerous friends here this evening, and I'll try to be as brief as I can. There's about five people here this evening that came from California that uh, had a great deal to do with uh, introducing my name to be uh, inducted into this great hall. And those are uh, Mr. Dave Wood, my partner, a good friend for 40 some odd years, Joanne Switzer, a friend of mine that uh, I went to college with, Jack Roddy, old Cotton Rosser, everybody knows him, and another friend of mine that uh, has helped me in the horse business, Billy Eade. I mean, excuse me, Billy Inc. When you receive one of these uh, awards and following the great KL, who was a wonderful friend of mine, unfortunately, he has passed on. But his wonderful spirit of a wonderful man will go on in all our memories and I wanted to pay tribute to KL. With that, behind all of us, as we try to live our life and accomplish whatever we're capable of, it takes a wonderful family, the joys of working with them, and I have to pay tribute to my mother and father. Without them getting together a country school teacher and a cowboy rancher, they instilled in me the principles and the values and the expectations that I needed to accomplish in life. And had that not been, I wouldn't be standing here this evening. I need to give credit to a lady that we've been, I've been married to for 50 years. She has, uh, she's been with me and helped me doctor calves in Montana at 20 below. She's cooked and fed the crews wherever we've been on ranches. She helped us and has raised two wonderful children, Mark and Nikki. She's been with me through the good times, the bad times, the hard knocks of ranching and she's never complained. And with her, as everyone says, behind whatever a man accomplishes, there's got to be a good woman. And she's it.
With that, I've been uh, blessed with a wonderful son who, uh, the minute he got out of Cal Poly, he was on a horse in about two days and eventually took over uh, our family ranch over in Owens Valley, at the foot of Mount Whitney. And without his help, I wouldn't have been able to accomplish what some people might think I have. He gave me the opportunity to get away and represent the cattle business, along with my wife staying home and taking care of everything. So that uh, I, when I represented the industry, uh, for the better. Uh, my daughter's here. She flew in from Hawaii and uh, on the Big Island. She and her husband uh, have a coffee farm there and they have a franchise business on the islands. She's part of our family partnership and has always been behind me all of, my li all of her life. I would also like to take this time, um, Lacey Livestock, by chance, quite a number of years ago, got together with uh, my partner and the, our family's partner, Mr. Dave Wood. Our partnership is uh, known as Centennial Livestock that we put together as a name partnership has been what uh, respectively uh, successful we've put together a working partnership that has brought me a friend the best friend I've ever had in my life and I think we've made uh, a lot of music together and we'll continue uh, on for the rest of the days we're together for certain with that, this particular award is something one never expects and never looks to try to accomplish, but it's such a humbling and wonderful experience for me. It's something that one I guess we'll always cherish. And with that, I'd like to thank all those here tonight, and I will certainly be in awe of this award the rest of my life. Thank you. Now, please welcome once again, Mr. Red Stegall. It may be hours before a word escapes my mouth. Across the creek through half a dozen gates latched behind me. Suddenly I hear my voice come from the outside in a gravelly phrase added to conclude the con conversation in my head. So addictive that I might forever stay praying like crazy in the wilderness talking to cattle and animals, to twisted trees, perfect springs, ever seeping. All who say lots of things these days as if they knew something and someone's got to listen. Those are lines from a poem entitled Out of Doors, penned by John Doffelmeyer from his book of poetry called Proclaiming Space, published by Dry Creek Press. And that's our Wrangler winner for Outstanding Poetry Book. It's sponsored by Harrison Orr Air Conditioning. John is a ranch-born Californian who now runs his own cow-calf operation, so his poetry rings with the truth of the Western experience. Proclaiming space describes the promise of what men, women, and life in general can be, what nature offers for that quest, and how the poetry can illuminate the way. Accepting the Wrangler for Outstanding Poetry Book, would you welcome John Doffelmeyer. Uh, 
Thanks, Fred. I'm going to make this short and sweet. I'm thrilled and deeply honored that my poetry has been recognized a second time by the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum. My first Wrangler in 2009 was a real surprise. It encouraged me to take my writing more seriously. I also want to thank the Western Folklife Center and the National Cowboy Poetry Gathering for offering a venue for my poetry and a readership for Dry Creek Press, our small press imprint, established in 1989. Since that time, Dry Creek Press has published the work of eight different Wrangler Award winners, including Proclaiming Space, and brought the likes of Buck Ramsey, Andy Wilkinson, Paul Zarziski, and David Wilkie to the Sierra Nevada foothills to share their unique talents with our isolated ranching community. But most of all, I want to thank my wife, Robin, for her love and support, for her hard work and ideas, and for her patience and understanding. I'm truly humbled because I didn't get here all by myself. Thanks. <laughs> is an Oklahoma actor who had a long-time role as Detective Frank Tripp on CSI Miami, the best damn thing on the show in my opinion. He's been in more than a dozen westerns over the years, including Wyatt Earp, Monty Walsh, and the Wrangler Award-winning film Appaloosa. That, that movie was co-written and produced by his buddy and fellow actor Robert Knott. Once again, we're kind of throwing caution to the wind here and teaming them up as presenters. So scoot your chairs back and prepare to evacuate the building. <laughs> Here are Rex Lynn and Robert Knott. All right, it's time to recognize the outstanding theatrical motion picture, and I'm proud to say the Wrangler, sponsored by Flint Co., goes to Django Unchained, written and directed by Quentin Tarantino. I think it's ironic that you were cast, Rex, as the guy named uh, Tennessee Harry. Why? Well, I, I mean, for the obvious reasons. I Did they four, not see you before you... I met four times with Quentin Tarantino, and he hired me as Tennessee Harry. Okay. Okay. That's what makes me such a great actor. It's written on there. I, there's no way I would say that. Uh, Django Unchained is an epic Western film with an all-star cast starring Jamie Foxx, Christoph Waltz, Leo DiCaprio, Kerry Washington, Samuel L. Jackson, and me. Yes, it is you. It's set in the antebellum era. The film follows a free slave who travels across the West with a bounty hunter on a mission to rescue his enslaved wife from a cruel plantation owner. And accepting the award for the outstanding theatrical motion picture this evening is none other than Mr. Rex Lynn. Thank you. Uh, I actually have a little note uh, that I got per email and I wrote it down. Um, it says, and I'm very happy about being here and accepting this award. On behalf of the four executive producers, and myself, thank you for honoring us for our efforts at making the best Western we could make. To be recognized by the museum is a great honor. As my friend Rex Lynn said on the set, it's good to be saddled up. Quentin Tarantino. Well done. Good deal. Okay, as a pair of natives from Oklahoma, Rex and I are well aware of the Great Plains which they went through during the dark time known as the Dust Bowl. That's what gives this year's award for outstanding documentary sponsored by Oklahoma Ford dealers so much meaning. The Wrangler goes to the Dust Bowl, produced and directed by Ken Burns, written and co-produced by Dayton Duncan. The Dust Bowl chronicles the worst man-made ecological disaster in American history in which the wheat boom with the great plow up 
followed by a decade-long drought during the 1930s, nearly swept away the breadbasket bread of the nation. This PBS documentary includes wild, vivid interviews of 26 survivors, dramatic photographs, and seldom seen movie footage that bring to life stories of incredible human suffering and equally incredible human perseverance. Accepting the Wrangler Award for Outstanding Documentary is Dayton Duncan. Thank you so much. Um, I've lived a blessed life. Uh, the film that Ken and I did on the uh, national parks uh, resulted in the uh, director of the National Park Service making me an honorary park ranger. I've got that hat, which I wish I had worn tonight since everybody else is wearing theirs. Mine's a flat brimmed one, uh, but I'm, I'm extremely proud of it. I've been blessed with a couple of Emmys, but my daughter is named Emmy, and that's the only Emmy I really will ever need in my life. Um, but this, a Wrangler, um, this is my third Wrangler, and it, they are very special to me. I grew up in a little town in Iowa. Uh, the only vacation that my family was ever able to take, uh, we loaded up our car and we headed west. And we went to national parks and saw the Great Plains for the first time. And I can't tell you truthfully that as a nine-year-old boy, I th thought then that this is what my life would become. But whatever I am now, I look back and I know that my life, what it became, began with that trip to the West. Uh, the film that Ken and I made is a film about nature, both about Mother Nature, the incredible uh, disaster, the 10-year drought that uh, afflicted the Southern Plains and particularly the panhandle of Oklahoma, which was the epicenter of the great crisis for 10 years during the 1930s. And it's also a story of human nature, of the folly that we can sometimes fall into uh, as well as the heroic perseverance of people who can uh, rise to incredible challenges in the face of almost unendurable hardship. And we were very lucky. It was a film that he and I had wanted to do for a number of years. We had other projects. We kept delaying it, and then we realized that if we didn't do this film when we did it, it would be too late because we really wanted to infuse it not only with the voices of the past, but with the living testimony of the people um, who lived through it. And with the help of OETA, the public broadcasting station here in the great state of Oklahoma, who helped us immeasurably to find folks who had lived through that uh, great crisis, we were able to infuse our story uh, not only with the historical documentation, but also with the living testimony of, of the people who did that. It will be the last, I think, uh, documentary of that nature. Five of the 26 people who are in our film in the two years between when I interviewed them and when our uh, film was broadcast have already passed away. So in their memory, and in the memory of my parents who took me west. Thank you very much. Our second and third inductions into the Hall of Great Western Performers are sponsored by Mr. and Mrs. Keith Bailey and Lisa and Wyatt McRae. And now, please welcome Emmy Award-winning casting director, Junie Lowry Johnson. counting on not being able to see you guys. <laughs> I thought it would be dark. So this is ah! the woman who discovered me for La Bamba. <laughs> this woman right here. <laughs> I never got to do that publicly. I also cast you in Longmire. Well, there's that too. 
I love you, Ludai. My children, yeah. thank you. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, it is very, very exciting for me to be here tonight. Um, I'm born and bred in Oklahoma. I love Oklahoma. My parents are from here. My grandparents were from here. And um, my brothers and I have moved to California. My sister lives in North Carolina, but our heart and soul remains here. Um, it is particularly exciting for me to be able to share in the honoring of the Cisco kid because when I was a very little girl and my mother was very involved in charity work here and she had put on through one of her organizations a charity um, horse show out at the fairgrounds and the star attraction, star everything was the Cisco kid. But it was a nighttime affair and we weren't allowed to go and we were beside ourselves over him being in town and so my mother unbeknownst to us you know just d just left it at that you can't come yuck 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 and that was on a Saturday night on Sunday afternoon the next day about three o'clock three thirty this truck pulls up in front of our house with a horse trailer and we're like what what and then we look out there and the Cisco kid gets out of his trailer and I lived on an infamous street in Crown Heights, it was 41st Street, and we literally had about 45 kids on our block. And I don't think my mom had told anybody, she must have told some of the parents, because as we're looking out our front door, everybody else is looking out their front door, and just this mass of children accumulated on our front lawn as the Cisco kid gets out, opens the trailer, and brings his horse out. And to this day, it was probably the most exciting day of our life. <laughs> It was absolutely magic, and for, I would say, the next two or three hours, he, with the two or three of his wranglers or stuntmen, entertained and talked and played with this mass of 45 kids on 41st Street. He taught us, uh, he let us all pet the horse. They had breakaway chairs in our front lawn that we would let the kids sit in. You know, he'd show you how, you know, he would crash one over the side of the truck and it fell apart. Um, he taught us all how to fake punch to do the right, you know, and so you'd, and he also told us, he was imparting some of his wisdom to everybody that the only fighting he believed in was fake fighting. It's only good to fight in the movies. It's not good to fight any place else. He emphasized the kindness to animals. And I remember him saying, if you find people that are kind to animals, you'll find people that are kind to people. So start with the animals, let that, you know, he was teach, talking to us like people, but like kids. It was truly, truly exciting. And the, um, I was talking to one of my childhood friends here to, uh, this morning, telling her I was coming here. And she was like, the Cisco kid. She's, I'm 63. She's 63. She goes, the Cisco kid? I still have my photo with the Cisco kid. So we, uh, I'm a big, I, we were celebrities at that point in time. And the culmination of that afternoon was my older brother, Dick, who has become a director in Los Angeles he got to break the breakaway chair over Cisco's back. And of course, Cisco was laughing and you know, supporting in this whole event. And I have to say, I think it was right then and there that a fascination and a passion was born in my brother and then my other brother and myself that led us all to Hollywood. For the last 30 years, my older brother, Dick Lowry, is a director. My other brother, Hunt Lowry, is a producer and I'm a casting director. And we love it there and we've loved our life and we come back here all the time. We still have property here, and this is our home. The year was 1950. Television was brand new and bringing the action and drama of the movies right into America's living rooms. Among the first Western heroes to gallop onto the scene were a pair of good guys who broke through the cultural barriers of the day to entertain and to inspire. They were role models off screen and on screen, and they represented this great, well, everything that this great institution stands for. They were the stars of the Cisco Kid. guitarist Howard Scott came up with the idea for the group's hit song, Cisco Kid, telling bandmates he wanted to honor the TV characters who were, at the time, the only Western heroes ethnic kids could relate to. Here's O. Henry's famous Robin Hood of the Old West, the Cisco Kid. 
The characters Cisco, played by Duncan Rinaldo, and his sidekick Pancho, played by Leo Carrillo, were of Mexican heritage. The show was fun and flashy. And with exciting special effects for the day. Are you hurt badly, Pancho? Oh, Cisco. Somebody kicked me in the pantry. Oh, I know. That tick, 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 she tried to blow us inside up. Carrillo's real life family roots went deep into the land of California and northern Mexico. Ronaldo was an orphan, unsure where he was born, possibly in Romania to Greek parents. He traveled widely as a young man and learned a variety of languages, including Spanish, and he knew where he wanted to end up, Hollywood. Once there, his dashing good looks got him cast as a Latin lover in a string of movies in the 30s. While Carrillo had starred in more than 90 films, leading up to the Cisco Kid features. Famous star night at the Coconut Grove is always an event looked forward to eagerly by the stars themselves. Under the spell of the palm, the workaday thoughts quickly fade and Leo blend. Carrillo, emceeing this glamorous Hollywood opening, shows how different his normal persona was from the character he would make famous on the big screen in the late 40s. Then, in the first television series shot all in color, that aired from 1950 to 1956. Cisco, you are deep thinking. And when you start to deep think, I smell fishes. You smell a fish now, Pancho? No, come to think of it, I don't, but I smell horses. Never mind that. Ronaldo and Carrillo were dedicated to the young people watching the series and offered themselves tirelessly to their fans, young and old. They altered their characters, patterned on outlaws of the original O. Henry stories, to be more like Robin Hood and Friar Tuck, heroes with a message. Ronaldo also didn't like the violence already creeping into television. So when he or Pancho had to shoot a bad guy, they usually just winged him. Anyway, Marshal, take him away. Ronaldo as Cisco was always righting wrongs and romancing the ladies. Carrillo played Pancho mostly for laughs, but Pancho could be serious when it came to delivering a message to the young people watching. You know, sometimes I think people is crazy. There's nothing so valuable as to steal and kill for it. You're very right, Pancho. It was a collaboration that endeared Carrillo, who was 70 by then, to an audience that was young enough to be grandchildren. The Cisco Kid was the most popular TV show of its kind. It made Carrillo an even bigger star and brought Ronaldo the fame and influence that had eluded him before. Ronaldo and Carrillo were in demand for civic functions and public appearances long after the show ended. Carrillo was a conservationist and cattle rancher who left huge tracts of land to the state of California for use as parks and recreation areas. Ronaldo gave frequent talks about the dangers of gun violence. He was an artist with a painting that hung in the Roosevelt White House. But for a generation of television viewers, he and Leo Carrillo will be remembered always as Cisco and Pancho. Adios, until we see you again, amigos. Hasta la vista. <laughs> and away they would go, riding off into the sunset and toward the dawn of a new adventure. Accepting the honor of the inductions are Duncan's son, son Richard Ronaldo, and Mick Caralco, executive director of the Leo Carrillo Ranch and Historic Park. I have to say that I promised my wife that I would try not to be funny. <laughs> and that's probably as funny as it'll get. <laughs> but being here tonight has brought something totally unexpected back to me, which is the memory of my best friend when I was 13 years old. My 4-H uh, club 
Hereford Steer Project. And my other best friend, uh, Rob Matthews from Calgary, Canada, who went on to become the president of the Stampede. I haven't seen him for 54 years, but he's also here tonight. I want to thank everybody associated with the museum, especially Wyatt McRae, for making possible this award. Induction into the Hall of Fame is the crowning achievement for my father, Duncan Rinaldo, whose life was quite remarkable. He came on his own to the United States at the age of 17, and to earn his passage, he shoveled coal in the boiler room of a merchant ship that sailed from Marseille. He had little formal education other than his attendance at an art school in Bucharest, Romania, and no context of any significance when he arrived here. Yet by 1923, Duncan found his way into the motion picture business first by working as a set painter, and then acting. His career was marked both by stunning successes and an array of adverse events, but he managed to overcome profound obstacles and continue to develop his career, both through acting and also writing. When he and Leo Carrillo made their first Cisco Kid movie, it is unlikely they would have been able to anticipate what kind of future they were about to create. For the Cisco Kid was to become one of the first programs to be made for syndication to television, and its success explains how radio, which was then dominant, gave way to television. It also represents a triumph of good over the dark side, as the original Cisco Kid from the O'Henry story was a very unsavory character. And by the time Duncan became Cisco and Leo became Pancho, they had a show where the two characters were more akin to Don Quixote and Sancho Panza, traveling the West, righting the wrongs of humanity. They helped everyone in need not for recompense, but because it was the right thing to do. It was their goal to minimize violence, and in their personal appearances, there was always a lecture about gun safety. They presented a positive image to America's youth, and it was also the way they lived their lives outside of the business. If Duncan and Leo were here today, we would find them fighting the use of gratuitous violence in film and television. Duncan had a rattlesnake on the top of the barrel of his 45, and when the rattles lined up with the head of the snake, the gun was on target. The barrel was also inscribed, please don't touch me, I don't want to hurt you. Thank you. What an awesome opportunity to be here tonight among so many creative and talented professionals. You know, uh, as the manager and curator of Leo Carrillo Ranch, I wanted just to say that, you know, Leo didn't just play a cowboy in the movies and on TV. He bought 2,000 acres of land in Carlsbad, California, brought in 600 head of cattle, and invited all his friends for a big party over and over again, doing all of those things that he embraced in the cowboy lifestyle. Being here tonight is a real honor, representing the memory of Leo Carrillo and all the work that he did. Rancho de los Quiotes in Carlsbad stands today as a park because Leo Carrillo had the foresight to set aside land for public use. People could come today, look around, see some of the acreage that was left, learn a little bit about what it was like to be a vaquero. See, Leo Carrillo was most proud of his Spanish heritage. So tonight, this is a real honor, and I appreciate you having me here, and I will continue to do my very best to tell his story and represent the life of a good man 
a poet, a philanthropist, a cowboy. So now I heard it in the audience. I know you all want to say it. Ready? Oh, Poncho! Oh, Cisco! Gracias. Our last induction into the Hall of Great Western Performers is sponsored by Tom and Judy Love. Please welcome the stars of last year's Wrangler Award-winning theatrical motion picture, Yellow Rock, Michael and Eddie Spears. Thank you, everyone. These awards wouldn't be complete without the recognition of the indigenous people in this land. As our history coincides from the beginning, I first worked with the man that we are about to honor in Lakota country, the Great Northern Plains in 1989. He was playing a role listed in the credits of Dances with Wolves as the toughest Pawnee. He was pretty tough, man. He brought life to the spirit and made that wild and fierce character so believable on screen. But off screen, he was you know, more of a father figure, someone that I looked up to and that I was fortunate to have learned a thing or two along the trail. He and my father, the late Patrick Spears, they got along famously. He's a kind of father that actually tucked me into bed a time or two. He's always an inspiration to watch and to work with. I'm humbled to stand up here in honor of one of my great mentors. He played my father in the TV series, Hell on Wheels. And again, in that role, as in so many others, he was able to get to the heart of the character and really drive it through the lens and make it real for the audience. And that's what made him an icon among those who admire great Western characters. During a legendary acting career, Wes Studi has portrayed great fictional warriors like the vengeful Huron Magua in the 1992 film Last of the Mohicans. He has also played great historic warriors, none greater than in Geronimo, an American legend, a role for which he and his castmates were honored with the Western Heritage Award. I can't let you kill any of those men. That was a great shot. Not so great, I aim for his head. Wes grew up far from famous, born in a spot that was more of a place than a town. My mother uh, grew up in an area called No Far Hollow, which is in northeastern Oklahoma, uh, Cherokee Nation. His family moved to Avent in the Osage, and as Wes began the third grade, he didn't know anybody, so he started learning the acting skills he would put to use years later. My uh, childhood at that point in time was pretty uh, uh, what was it? <laughs> isolated. Uh, I was, uh, unless we went home to uh, the family and all, you know, we, we weren't around any other charities. And uh, um, so I developed a pretty good imagination about, you know, playing by myself, you know, <laughs> because all my younger brothers were like a little too young for me, for them to be able to play at my level, you know. Some Apaches are good farmer. Others miss the old way. I am not good farmer, Gatewood. Like the warrior Geronimo, young West Studi had no interest in farming. He was a dreamer, and movie theaters were his magic carpet. I mainly went to them by myself. I, you know, I was the lone guy sitting there watching the horses run and everything. It was, uh, uh, I remember the movies being a, a real escape or respite from, you know, daily life. At Shilako Indian School, he signed up for the National Guard. I joined it mainly because 
We got, we got uh, to dress up in fatigues and march on Saturday mornings. <laughs> and he ended up becoming a real life warrior in the U.S. Army, right in the middle of the Vietnam War. It all seemed like such a great adventure, to the point that I thought, geez, I'd really like to see what it's like in a combat area like that. The Vietnam experience changed West's duty, as it did so many others. He returned more serious, joined the American Indian movement. And it never really entered my mind about uh, doing anything in the, in the acting world until uh, um, after the, um, the social unrest of the early 70s. But a classic role in Dances with Wolves followed work on stage and in local TV productions in Tulsa. Other famous roles quickly followed. In 2009, West Studi broke more ground as one of the stars of the biggest blockbuster of all time, Avatar. West Studi is more than an actor, he's an artist, a musician, and an advocate for Indian people. Ladies and gentlemen, help us honor our friend and our newest inductee into the Hall of Great Western Performers, our Indian avatar, West Studi. God, I could use this for weight training, eh? <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm overwhelmed. I'm actually overwhelmed. I've been overwhelmed for like two weeks, more like two months. Eddie, Michael, I'm so proud I can share the stage with you tonight because we do go back to 89. And uh, <laughs> I, it just, it, it kind of knocks me out. These, these young men were like this tall and this tall. The first time I saw them, man, I must be old. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> but I want to thank uh, the National Cowboy Western Heritage Museum. Uh, for this wonderful honor, and it uh, it means a whole lot more because I really am from here, from the state of Oklahoma. And the state of Oklahoma and its people, and perhaps most importantly, my family who sits right here, this table here. Brother Bob, my wife Mara, my brother Andy, his wife Carla, my mother Maggie, my niece, the spot, Chelsea, Jory, her husband, my beautiful daughter Leah, and Jake, her soon-to-be husband. That's it. I want to thank them for all of their support throughout the years. I could not have done the things I've done over the years were it not for their support and guidance and help throughout life. And Oklahoma has taught me throughout the years the value of the work ethic, being on time, doing the job like you should do it. It's like ranch work. I have done ranch work in my life.
doing what needs to be done at the time it needs to be done and doing it right. That. That has always been a wonderfully productive ranch ethic. My father worked on ranches. Some of you may even know of ranches in uh, northern Oklahoma. Uh, the late W.G. Skelly of Skelly Oil Company once held, owned a uh, ranch uh, in northern Oklahoma uh, near Avant, Oklahoma, called uh, the Candy Creek Ranch. And that was the, yeah? You know Candy Creek Ranch? Wonderful. Uh, my father worked there, and that was the first time I ever stole away from the, mom, you don't know this, <laughs> stole away <laughs> from the house when, the ho when they used to bring the horses in and, and uh, keep them in the barns there for a while. I went out there and I got on them. <laughs> you didn't know that. But now you do, and so you can rest easy. And so can I. Again, it, it's a, an extremely overwhelming idea to be inducted into a Hall of Fame. And I wish, I wish that Leo Carrillo, Duncan Rinaldo, and Robert Mitchum could have joined us here on this stage tonight. <laughs> now, that would really have been quite an honor to stand here with icons of that nature, that caliber. But, like I say, it's an overwhelming thing to know that if, if and perhaps when, the National Cowboy Hall of Fame continues 500 to 1,000 years into the future, my presence will be there. That's an overwhelming thought when you think about it. When, when I first was told I was going to receive this honor, I thought, well, oh, God, what, what does that mean? What in the world does that mean that, but that's just it, right? Posterity, years and years and years will pass and one day, 500 years from now, someone will look back into the archives and books of the National Cowboy Hall of Fame, and that's immortality, isn't it? Oh my God, that's immortality, oh my. And I wanna thank you. I wanna thank you very much for that opportunity, and I know that as time goes on, more and more, indigenous people will join the ranks. Now, I don't want to take up much more of your time because I know it's getting late. But because I'm the last one standing, <laughs> I'd like you invite you all to stand. Now, stretch. Oh, stretch it this way, stretch it that way, and straight up, and oh, and then kind of just rub it a little bit. Ah, oh, nice. Ah, oh, feels good, doesn't it? Again, I want to thank the National Cowboy Hall of Fame Museum, Western Heritage, for all its efforts, I know it's going to absolutely be an outstanding organization for time immemorial. I love you all. Take care of yourselves. Drive carefully. Hey! Quite a guy there, huh? Lou, it's been a wonderful time spending the evening with you. And as a little memento of the evening, I thought I'd remind you of 
probably some of your uh, first experiences in front of the public and uh, in support of the beef industry. So I've got you a little parting gift here. <laughs> One of Lou's first jobs was at Whataburger. <laughs> I just want to remind him of his humble beginnings. As, as Mel Tillis used to say, what, 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 Whataburger. Uh, and you know, I never, I never got to make a speech when I received my, my Employee of the Month uh, uh, award, which I did in Corpus Christi, Texas as, uh, as a Whataburger employee. So, so I'd like to thank, thank my crew and uh, I flipped a damn good burger and I, and I still do today. Uh, what I want to say is, uh, <laughs> you know I can. I got some skills, brother. You know what I'm saying? We, sh we, sh we showed them Southwest style. Uh, what an amazing evening. What an absolutely wonderful evening. I want to thank each and every one of you for living the life that the Western Heritage Awards espouses. One of dignity, one of integrity, one of respect. God bless you. Go out there. Keep being great Americans. And uh, we had a good time tonight. Thank you. Good night and God bless you.